so you're a 19 year old American man. A lot of things are factually speaking stacked against you, but you don't want to be a loser and be mad about politics and fat and living with your mom as you so nicely described. Um, what do you do and what do you avoid? Yeah, the biggest thing you want to avoid is that enabling pattern of behavior because most of these guys didn't have a, a, a dad figure or their dad was kind of some cucked, checked out guy. And so as bad as my childhood was in a lot of ways, my dad did make me take martial arts when I was getting bullied. He did say like, well, I mean, you're getting bullied. You got to like do martial arts. And it was just very matter of fact. That was because that was the old school kind of masculine thing, which is. I mean, you're a chubby kid. You're getting picked on. You got to learn how to fight and you're just going to have to fight people. And that's just the way it's going to be. Yes. Right. That's what I was talking about. Whereas, whereas the mom, the fe the feminine wants to nurture, right? Which is good, but then that also enables. So everything, if you look at things energetically, the masculine draws boundaries, but then it can become too harsh and unforgiving, right? Right. And that's why God has man and woman. But the woman will enable, oh, baby boy, oh, you're sad. Oh, let me give you some ice cream. Oh no, you have a bad day, right? And you, so you have to have that duality of energy, that struggle that creates a complete person or a whole person. So if you're 19, you would just want to have a, you. everything starts with you with a piece of paper and a pen and you're just assessing where your life is, right? And you're, and you're asking yourself, I don't know, was I enabled by a overly nurturing mother? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe your problem's different. Maybe your dad was a dick and he didn't give you love. And so now you struggle with love and you're, you're too harsh, right? Whatever it is. But you just sit down and you start assessing where you are in life, realizing that, especially if you're 19, everybody who's old and rich would love to be 19 again, right? One, you have all the wealth in the world, even if you don't think of it that way. And I wish somebody had told me that when I was younger. Warren Buffett trades places with you in a second. Here, you can be me as an 80 year old billionaire and you can, I'll be 19 again with whatever bad position you're in. W would you take the deal? Every billionaire would you think Bill Gates wouldn't take that deal. That's why they're all obsessed with transhumanism. They're trying to figure out a way to get into younger bodies, right? That's what ultimately transhumanism is about is the fear of mortality, the rejection of God, the rejection of the infinite. So in your own mind, you're thinking, how can I, how can I be in a younger body? So one is like, what are you crying about, bro? Right? What are you what are you crying about? You have time to fix it. It's gonna take five years. Get on a five year timeline. Everybody's on this short timeline. Right. If you're in a, a bad position, and you've probably seen this with people who when they give in despair, they're just not thinking of the timeline. So, oh, your business failed. Okay, you're probably gonna be broke, dude, for a couple of years. You're not gonna be like not broke in a day, but you're not gonna be broke in five years if you set yourself on the right path. Or like whatever your problem is, it's just going to take time, bro. It's going to take five years. But start taking immediate action right now in whatever way you can. For me, the easiest thing in the world to do if you're a young man, just start reading old books. I said, just what books? Go on the great court. Go look up the great books of Western civilization. Read read a hundred great books. Go to the gym four times a week. Call me in a year. You won't call me in a year because you'll be kind of figuring things out, right? So what happens is. And again, I blame movies and I blame narrative. I'm actually, a f I learned a lot from the postmodernists, even though they're often attacked on the right. The idea of postmodernism and examining narrative structures and how narrative structures control thought. So the narrative structure is you're a man, you find the green hornet ring and you become some kind of superhero. Or you're a man and your long lost father is actually half God. And he's going to send you on this hero's journey and they're going to send you your sword and the shield, right? If you look at mythology and you look at the narrative structure people have, there's, even if people don't recognize it, they will now if they listen, unconsciously you believe someone's going to save you. The mentor appears. If you look at the hero with a thousand faces, if you look at the hero's journey, you look at all these narrative structures embedded in our unconscious is, oh, I'm kind of sitting at home. I'm Anakin Skywalker on a desert island orphaned, adopted, whatever the case is. Oh, the Jedi's find me. The Jedi's train me. And then I go on my journey. The mentor appears. Bro, the mentor doesn't appear. That's fake. Okay. So get it out of your mind that the mentor is going to appear and rescue you from your situation. You got to be your own mentor, right? And then once you start from that at a deep level, realizing nobody's coming to save you, and that's fine. That shouldn't make you afraid. 
you have to realize that was what's holding you back because you you kept waiting for the great awakening, the great moment to appear. It's not going to happen. You're just going to get older and decay and give into entropy. So you're your own mentor. Go read the great books of Western civilization. Go to the gym three, four times a week. And then tell me where you are in a year. And by that time, you'll you'll find your path. But you have to believe that you can find the path. Right. And nobody will do that. What are what are the traps, the stumbling blocks along the way for young men? Thousands. You get somebody pregnant, you lose yourself, you drink. Well, I don't and think anyone gets anyone pregnant anymore. Unwanted teen pregnancies are still happening. I mean, people are still fornicating, even if on our side of the internet, well, there's just, there's more abortions happening. So the And more celibacy. Involuntary, but the top guys are having more women. There, there's more involuntary celibacy, but you want to look at Charles Munger had a good line: um, "Don't race trains or do cocaine." Right? The and the message, the sentiment of that was: if you're sending a young man on his path, you want to say, "Here are the big things that you don't want to do. You don't want to get a woman, the wrong woman, pregnant. You are with her if she doesn't have an abortion for 20, 25. You are tied now to that person." quantumly, cosmically, and materially and physically for decades now. So you don't want to do that. That's a big problem. You don't want to do that. You don't want to kill yourself. You don't want to drive your car drunk. You don't want to race cars. You don't want to race a train. Can I beat the train, right? You don't want to jump off cliffs, off 50 feet into water, and you don't know how deep it is, right? But as glib, and I don't mean to be glib, but that's how much belief I have in young men to know that, hey, here's some guardrails. Figure it out, dude. Just start reading books. Go to the gym. Because then what will happen? People are afraid to let things emerge organically. The male brain, and I've seen this with people I know who are incredibly successful, but no kids. Because in their brain, they talk about everything that can go wrong. Oh, well, what if I get married to this woman? She divorces me. And their brain spirals. They've created a thousand new problems that, one, you're going to have problems anyway. Right? You're going to have problems anyway. Of course it's going to happen. What if I start a business? I mean, yeah, you're going to have a payroll problem at some point. You might have to get a line of credit. There are ways to do it. You're going to lose sleep because you might think you might go bankrupt and you might think people are going to make fun of you and you might feel like, why did I do this? Uh, yes, I'll, all of this is going to happen. Who gives a fuck? You know, it's like you want to just shake these guys. Well, so that you're describing what strikes me as the bigger problem. So the examples that you gave a second ago were all sort of unbridled masculine energy needing, as you said, guardrails, right? Mm -hmm. Don't drive drunk or right. jump off cliffs. I don't see any cliff diving or impregnating going on. I, at least in the class of people that I'm around it, and maybe it, you know, we're from different roles. Maybe that's it. But it seems like young men are afraid. They're too cautious. They have like some sort of hormonal imbalance that makes them more female, more, I don't know, less likely to take big risks. Yeah, I can't save them. I tell them to go to church. There are churches, there are institutions that help those people. So in terms of my messaging, I always think about who I'm writing for. Yeah. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Why am I wasting my time doing this bullshit? You know, where I get attacked, smeared, called every kind of name, got investigated by Mueller, know that I'm on the regime's like, Target, what the fuck am I doing? This is stupid, right? I could just go live a nice, quiet life, disappear off the face of the earth, smoke cigars all day, hang out with my kids, go to the gym. What am I doing? Why am I doing this, right? And the answer is because I'm writing for who I was when I was 19, 20, 21. Just tell me what to do, bro. Give me the playbook. I'll figure it out. Give me the playbook. I'm not for the guy who, oh, I'm so depressed. The world is so rigged. I'm going to go watch anti-Semitic podcasts all day because the Jews, the Jews are holding me down, you know? Blah, 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 blah. Those are not my people. Those are lost souls. And it isn't my spiritual obligation to reach them. That's the obligation of the church. That's the obligations of pastors because I'm not caring enough to reach them, right? I don't want to hear how you're a sad panda. That you're just... <laughs> <laughs> right. You're I'm not the right person for you. There are people who are the right people for you. Go walk into a church. Oh, I'm afraid I'll feel awkward to go to church. It's like, well, what give me a break, dude. At some point with these people, you wonder where how we're enabling them by talking about all the systemic problems, which are real, but realizing go to a church. That's why pastors exist to nurture you, to kind of put you on the right direction, to deal with your fucking beta cuck bullshit. But that's not for me. 
I'm not here to save your soul. That's the church. The church is there to save your soul. I'm here to take someone who's maybe had kind of a fucked up home life, maybe has had a, a wrong turn in life, but they will do things, but they don't have the knowledge, right? So I'm thinking, how can I give them knowledge? What do I wish somebody had told me? What's the knowledge you need? What are the, the pitfalls that you want to avoid? Here you go. Here's a one page piece of paper. Follow the instructions and then you're not going to need me because you're, you're the mentor. You're the mentor. Your own mentor has appeared in your own mind. You are your mentor, right? Why are you against porn? Ayahuasca. I, I think most people who participate in porn were molested as kids. So then that puts you downstream of the, the pedophile cycle of behavior. So for me, I just, my heart just breaks that people do it because I, I went from a, somebody, the ego is self-satisfying, right? This is what the ego wants to do, validation and self-satisfaction. And you realize that these are broken people and you're participating in the spiritual damage that was done to them and you're spiritually damaging yourself. So it isn't, oh, that's a sin, you're gonna go to hell. God's gonna strike you down with thunder. It's more, you're damaging yourself spiritually when you engage with this material. And that person is even way more damaged. And now you're caught in this cycle of molestation and problems that these people have dealt with. So why in the world would you want to be downstream of that level of trauma, right? That cosmic trauma, get the hell, get the hell out of that. And you didn't see that before. No, no, because I was just, look, I was in culture. We were all groomed. Okay. There was a, you know, grooming is a big term now and everybody blames it on drag queen story or whatever. I watched a documentary on Woodstock 99. It was the, the redo of Woodstock. And there was a point in there, a subplot, and it was delivered by the documentary filmmaker. Cause I understand propaganda. I know when they're propagandizing, but they were right. It was very much when you were of my era, Gen X, oh, girls gone wild, show us your tits. Oh, they're going to Mardi Gras. Everybody get drunk, show your tits. That's vulgar. I look at that now as, as vulgar and disgusting, but that was completely normalized on yes. us. Howard Sturman do a radio show. Oh, Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen, Olsen, they're 14. When do they turn 18? Sexualizing a 14 year old, but it's like what David Foster Wallace said, does a fish know that it's in water, right? When you're in water, you don't know you're in water. You know when you're out of the water. Right When you're in water, you don't know. We were all swimming in a sewer, not realizing that we are being groomed to fornicate, to sexualize people who are way too young to be sexualized. And that was all being groomed on us. So that it just becomes like a normal thing. Oh yeah, girl's gone wild. Oh yeah, girl gets drunk, shows her tits. She probably, that's probably the lowest point of her life doing that when the videos come in and she's sober. But if you don't have a higher awareness, you're just a, another participant in the Bacchanal carnival of degeneracy. Right. But you don't realize it because you're swimming in that filth. And then as I've tried to get out of that sewer and as I work more and more to, to sanctify and purify my heart, you realize, oh God, how could I watch this? So for me, it didn't even take willpower to not watch it. I just said, how could I, how could I watch that? That make my heart says, you can't, you can't watch this. And I just like, okay. So, so five, six, seven years ago, whatever. I was like, I can't watch this anymore. And that was it. Didn't, it wasn't a struggle. It wasn't hard. And that's where, you know, we talked earlier about the difference between the heart and the mind and relearning that the, the heart is its own form of consciousness, its own form of intelligence. The more you live in your heart, the less willpower it takes. It doesn't take willpower to refuse to participate in cycles of trauma when your heart is talking. Because your heart would say, what are we doing? But if it's your mind, you think, oh man, I've... I got a few minutes to blow off. I'm kind of bored. Now eh, let's just see what's new. And then of course it's been proven that the when they watch pornography, you watch worse and worse stuff. You don't start with the National Geographic topless pics of the tribes, <laughs> at, you know, and then you end there. You start there and you end at just really sketchy stuff, right? And what so that tells you right there that it's demonic. Because if it were satiating, if pornography were satiating, you would say, oh, okay, here's a 70s era, bad movie. Oh, she comes in and she's pretty. And th there was a certain, at least, elegance or art to it. You would be fine ending there. How many people end there, right? It's a gateway 
that keeps corrupting the soul. Well, so I'm interested in what you said, that you know it's demonic because it doesn't satisfy you. Right. Explain that. What does that mean? The, the demons don't want you to have inner peace. The worst problem for the forces of evil, for the demons, for the negative energy, is when you're existing in a state of love and you're existing in a state of flow, of light, of being, of lightness. That's the worst thing in the world for the demons because that's how they lose you. They want to they drag you down into the muck as much as they can and take you as low as they can because then you feel like you can't be reached, you can't be helped. You've gone too far, right? So you once you realize the spiritual component of it too, you think, ah, you motherfucker, I know what you're doing. This collective racial guilt that white people carry around that, that nobody else does. If you look at any other um, ethnic or racial group, no one carries around this strange guilt for sins that were committed before you were ever born. And I don't understand it. I don't understand where that comes from. I don't understand the biological basis for it, the spiritual basis for it, because carrying around collective guilt, racial guilt is actually anti-Christian. It doesn't make any sense at all. And it's a, it's a knot that I haven't been able to unravel. I mean, it, it, it does seem like they're disappearing, the, just like as a numbers matter. And even saying that is forbidden, which itself is really revealing. I mean, if this were true of, you know, Comanches or Aleutian Islanders or Han Chinese, you know, if they were diminishing in number really strikingly, really quickly over a short period of time, you'd be like, what the hell is going on with Filipinos? <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not reproducing. Everyone hates them. They're dying. Uh, but even to say that about whites is like somehow bad or something. And that tells you that we've all internalized this hate white people thing. You really don't know where that comes from? Well, a great example of that is that if you look at gun deaths, this is how they they bring the stats on deaths. They go, oh, there's 50,000 gun deaths a year. When you look at it, it's suicide. It's almost exclusively white male suicide via yes. firearm. And I always said that if you really cared about gun deaths, you would immediately do an intervention into white male suicide because that is the primary usage of guns. Do you know suicides. white men who've killed themselves personally? Not personally, no. I know a friend who had an overdose yeah. with uh, opioids, so... I a guess. form of it. I, I know yeah. a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm probably, I'm several years older than you, um, but I know a lot. I know like five at least. So yeah, that's that's interesting. Right. So if you cared, if you cared about gun deaths, you would know that the lowest hanging fruit is white male suicide, right? You would know that you're not going to confiscate people's guns. That would cause social a lack of social cohesion that none of us even want to think about. All of that is fake. The real thing you would go after is gang violence and you'd go after white male suicide. If you cared, if you actually cared about gun deaths, you wouldn't point out the occasional tragic school shooting, which is statistically very unlikely, even though they're horrific when they happen. You would say, okay, we have a gun violence problem to solve. How are they being used? Okay. Most of the people killing each other with them are gang bangers. And then you have white males killing themselves. Let's do an immediate... I mean, it's it's laughable to imagine this happening in a world that were logical and not driven by hatred. You would see all kinds of interventions, public service announcements happening about white male suicide. It would be one of the biggest issues people talked about. You would say, did you have any idea? Most people don't. Most people think you're lying about the stats when you tell them, oh, no, half half of the gun deaths that they bring up are suicide. And white men are three point five times more likely to kill themselves than anyone else. And people go, that can't be true. Like, well, you can go. The black women are the most oppressed group in the United States. That is a, an a article of faith for everybody. We hear that every, literally every day. Um, but the suicide rate among black women is like negligible. Well, nobody, yeah, nobody's ever been able to square the circle of how media imaging suppresses the self-esteem of black Americans who have almost no suicide, but it's building up the white self-esteem but then the whites are the ones killing themselves, right? There's no, there's no logic. Right. So it's so, I guess that's kind of my point is not to whine about it because I hate whining about anything, particularly about race. However, it's so illogical. It's so like absurd that it suggests that there's something deeper going on, which is people are kind of happy when whites die. And that's obviously true. Oh yeah. There's a deep hatred that. There's a deep hatred and it would just be, it would be a lot easier if I weren't white to, to note this because you're a white supremacist if you note it. But even that, it's like 
stop complaining about people dying because if you complain about it, you're evil or something like that whole formulation is so uh, sick. That, like, yeah, you're you, they the framing is not only you can't talk about it, but if you talk about it, then you'll be labeled a white nationalist, a white supremacist. <laughs> right. You're thinking, bro, I'm talking about suicide. I thought you wanted fewer gun deaths. Right. You're telling me that you want fewer gun deaths. And I'm telling you, here's a way to do that. And now you're saying, no, that's actually racist to say that that's a way to say But where lies. does it come from? I guess that's my question is, where does that impulse come from? Is it, is it envy? I mean, white men have, you know, created a lot, the overwhelming majority of technological advances, for example, in the 20th century, you know, electricity, the airplane, et cetera. Um, is it that that makes people angry? Is it, is there something spiritual going on? Like, what is this? And it, it does seem like it'd be helpful just to acknowledge that this is absolutely real. The numbers show it. The mass migration around the world into majority white countries to make them minority white countries clearly driven by hate, obviously. Um, but where's that hate come from? What is that? The ethnic groups have always hated each other. Like the R Rwandan genocide for me was always a hard thing to wrap my Americanized brain around. Yes, yes. Because if you're American, your whole world is, there's white people, black people. <laughs> right. And, and right. once you go there, no, no, they no, it's so true. The Cambodians hate the Vietnamese and the it's Thais totally and Vietnamese right. hate each other. I remember everyone hates the Chinese yeah, in Southeast yeah. Asia, right? And I then got the it. Han Chinese hate the other Chinese, right? Yes. So anywhere you look, there's always been ethnic strife. And I think that that's why the agenda, the anti human agenda, is to just cram as many different people together as they possibly can knowing that this will create some kind of strife. So there can't be, there can't be order, right? So yes. if you look at, yes. I look at it again, real or metaphorically, demons are chaos. God is logos. God is order. Yes. Right. So when you look at forces driving chaos, then you can usually say that's the anti-human, that's the demonic element. Because again, the demons don't care who comes up ahead. If the demons could somehow incite a race war, they don't care what side wins. They only care that a lot of people kill each other, that there's a lot of despair, that there's a lot of suffering, that they can harvest a lot of that negative energy. That's all they care about. So then when we talk about these issues, for me, it's always challenging because one, you don't want to make people feel persecuted. You don't want to that make is people exactly feel right. oppressed. Yes, I totally agree. Can yeah. we just pause for a second? I've struggled with this a lot as I've watched the anti-white hate kind of define our country and destroy a lot of people I know. It's hard to talk about, not because I care about being called a racist. I'm not a racist. I don't care if they call me that, but because I don't want to inspire self-pity or a sense of persecution in people because it's really bad for people. That's exactly right. Right. And then it can add to the tribalism. Well, so you, totally, which we don't, you don't want. Yeah. You don't want white men thinking, oh boy, they're out to get us. And now I, I agree. So a lot of times you throw your hand up in the air thinking, how do I even, how do you even handle these how issues? How do you address it? Yes. Because it is an issue. Opioid overdose deaths are an issue. And the way that I try to address it in a spiritual way is I try to focus on a general aspirational message. So I get into the weeds on politics. I get in the mud. I'm not claiming to be some great guru or whatever, but I always, if you read me long enough, you know that I generally speaking believe that if you decide to not be a loser, you can live a good life. You're not going to maybe live your dream life. Right. You're not going to be in the Yankees. I was never on the Yankees. I'm not Alex Rodriguez. That's fine. You can you can just accept that you're not going to be that. But if you decide, you know what? I just don't want to be some pathetic loser, angry all day about politics, getting fat with my mom who has enabled this behavior. <laughs> it's true. And if you read me long enough, you know, like, I believe in you. I don't think I, I'm not going to sell you a lie and tell you that you're going to be anything that you can want to be because that isn't the way embodiment works. But you can live a good life. And there's a lot to be said for just living a good life. Right. There's a lot to be said for living a nice, normal life. Yes. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. We hope you'll subscribe to it. And by the way, you can hit the little bell on there and get notifications every time we produce a video. We hope you'll do that also.